Um, I just wanted to begin by asking how many of you are at a WordCamp for the very first time? That is so amazing. I'm so happy that you are going to be with me this morning listening to my talk because it's really geared towards people that are somewhat new to WordPress but that are getting to know the community because that's sort of what my story is and how I got started with WordPress. How are you enjoying yourselves so far? Excellent. Very good. So I'd like to begin my talk by showing you a photo taken at WordCamp Montreal in 2013. And so I want to draw your attention to the lady in red sitting on the left. So it seems like they're sitting in a presentation just like this one, uh, listening, she's taking notes. You know, could take a guess, maybe she's a blogger or a business owner, um, maybe she's a developer. Well, that's actually my mother. <laughs> and she uh, really surprised me because she attended a WordCamp before WordCamps were even on my radar. And um, so she told me, oh, I went to this, uh, this tech conference, WordCamp. Um, I went to go listen to this young entrepreneur named Matt Mullenweg. It was so amazing. I even uh, volunteered to work on the AV team. So she was telling me all this, and I'm going to um, admit something that probably paints me in a pretty terrible light. But when she told me she'd done this, I thought, that's cute, but like, you don't belong there. Which is awful, and you know, this can't leave the room. It's awful. Um, but she was telling me this, and um, my gut reaction was just to think, like, you know, you, what are you doing there? Like, it's neat and everything, but tech conferences are for people that have it together. It's for people that work in the industry. It's for people that have a following. It's for people that have Twitter followers above 1,000. Like, why, why are you going to this tech conference? But um, I, she really opened my eyes to, to sort of getting rid of that fear and that, uh, that fraudulent fear of being a poser or being out of place. And, uh, and so now I'm going to share with you sort of the story of how I got into tech, which is kind of a whirlwind story of about a year and a half um, behind me. So my name is Andrea Zollner, and I am studied journalism, but now I work as a content consultant for Automatic, the company behind WordPress.com. So um, I worked in, I studied journalism, and I worked in corporate communications for a few years. And then I decided that I wanted to pursue technology, and I wanted to pursue careers in technology. And, but I always had this idea, this feeling that um, if you weren't a developer, you couldn't work in technology. You couldn't make a decent living working in technology. There was just no space for that. And if you weren't a developer, a software programmer, um, or you know, something along those lines, you were probably making a living with WordPress, running a very profitable blogging website. Or maybe you just had websites that were generating a lot of ad revenue. I didn't really consider that as a writer, I could have a career in technology. And uh, so everything sort of changed a year and a half ago when I quit my communications job to intern with Automatic. And I hadn't been an intern since I was a teenager. So the idea of leaving sort of a comfy job and starting all the way at the bottom was not that appealing. But if you know Automatic, you know it's kind of a, an opportunity you can't pass up. So uh, in the last year and a half, I've worked as a freelance web developer um, a translator, an editor, a content specialist, and have sort of jumped around. And I also worked for a college, much like Humber in Montreal, because um, they were transferring their website to a new theme in WordPress. And it was a multi-site with 120 websites. And I taught eight, 80 people to use WordPress. So that was one of the most fun experiences I had with WordPress. Uh, you can view these slides. Um, at andreazolner.com slash WCTO2015, although I'll warn you now that they're very minimalist slides. So if for visibility's sake you want to pull them up, that's great. But um, most of the content that will be shared today will be just storytelling. So let's go back to this photo of my mother. Because um, this is really where it starts. I'm, I'm sort of battling these feelings of feeling like an imposter or fraud, and I'm telling her that she doesn't belong. And I really was projecting. I think that you know, I didn't really understand what jobs in Silicon Valley were. I heard concierge, ninja, wrangler. What do these mean? 
Um, and so these were some of the lies that I was telling myself that were preventing me from actually exploring job opportunities. I was telling myself all these things that I really had no foundation for. Uh, and so I'm going to break down my talk into three lies and three truths that I discovered as I explored careers in technology as a non-coder, non-developer, non-technical person. So the first lie that I told myself was web design equals coding. So you can't remove code from web development. I'm not claiming that you can. But after working on a few projects, and I'm sure if you talk to a lot of project managers and web developers here, you'll get a sense that uh, web design isn't just about good code. It's also about a lot of different sensitivities coming together to build a really great product or a really great website. And you, know, you can come with, to that project with all sorts of background knowledge as well. So you, know, you need UX designers, you need writers, you need um, people that can project manage, which is a skill in and of itself. And I realized that you know, all of those roles that are played you know, might require different people. And that's really where you can go and shine and bring your value to a project. So you need front-end developers and back-end developers, graphic designers, UX designers, and writers. Are, do we have any writers in the room? That's great. Tech is a space that's so new that uh, I feel like it's a great opportunity to sort of claim claim a space in it. You can bring your skills and say, this is a very new domain, and this is where I'm going to find my niche. Um, I feel like I studied journalism where we were taught that you're a jack of all trades and that you're supposed to adapt. But that doesn't always mean a great career either, because you can just be jumping around. But I, in my mind, I kind of see it as a Venn diagram. And where some of my skills overlap, I can have a specialty. And so. Being a writer in tech, for example, could be a specialty. And when you think about what you're reading on pages, it's not the code language that you first see when you land on a page. It's English, it's French, it's German, it's Italian, it's all sorts of other languages. And so translators can have a really great career working in technology because there's a need for multilingual content. And I don't know if any of you have visited plugin pages, but Oftentimes, they're very confusing. The, um, the documentation is, needs some work. Um, the user instructions need some work. And so that's a technical writing position that could exist. And that maybe isn't filled at the moment. So that's just an example of how writers can sort of get into uh, working in technology. I know that if you're a freelance writer, working in technology can just be another contract. It can be just like writing about law or writing about um, another, another field. But it's also a great way to get into a more, um, and get, turn it into a career, I would say. Because learning the lingo is really valuable as well. And that's something that I learned over the last year is that um, by working with people that were in technology and getting a sense of what a project was from beginning to end, then you would start adopting the same, the same vocabulary. And that's surprisingly very valuable. If you can communicate with people on a project, you don't need to know the code behind it. But being able to get a sense of what they're working on and documenting that and being a support to them just by knowing sort of what's happening and what the vocabulary are, is, what's the, uh, what are the popular plugins, what are things that are happening. Being in the know is super valuable. And that you can do just by exposure. Um, another lie that I was telling myself is, if I can't do it quickly and I can't do it alone, I shouldn't be doing this at all. Now this is something that was hard for me because when I made the leap into tech, I was pretty good at my job before and I was deciding to go into a field that I was not good at at first. And so that is, is very, um, it's easy to put all these expectations on yourself and try and um, be somewhere where you're not quite there yet. And that's something that you have to fight because it's easy to get discouraged and it's easy to build up these expectations of yourself that are going to be really hard to, to meet. And so by sort of being kind to yourself and giving yourself the time to learn and giving yourself the space to learn, 
uh, is, was really important in allowing myself to uh, explore these careers in technology. So I'm not saying that you can just sort of coast by until you've got it, but uh, it does require putting in extra effort. So for example, when I was working at the college, if there was something that I needed to get done and that I was struggling with or that was a little bit not happening as fast as I wanted it to be, um, I, you know, it was just the reality of being somewhat new to, to development or new to sort of that field. I would work on it in the evenings and then come the next day and everything would just go smoother and faster. So those are some tricks that you do as a beginner is that you just can't have to do your homework, unfortunately. There's no way around it. But I still wanted to be kind and, and give myself the space to do that. So, um, you know, it is a time investment. I had to look up a lot of things after work. I had to spend time reading and asking questions. But um, that's what also colleagues and friends are for. If you have colleagues in a space where you are that are really good at what they do in, in tech, so if they're developers or um, if they have a certain knowledge base that's really valuable, I mean, those are the people that you want to be asking. But not just technical questions. I often ask them about their process, about the way that they work, about their workflow, about tips and tricks to speed things up because it might not strike them as something obvious that's really valuable to a beginner. They might say, this is how you do that. There you go. But when you break it down, they say, well, I use this in this way. I use this productivity tool, or I make sure that I open these tabs first. Those are little tips and tricks that can actually fast track your knowledge as well. Because not only are you getting sort of the technical how to, you're getting all of those steps that they built up over years that you can just kind of get right away. And so I always encourage people to ask a lot of questions about Yes, how to do something, but what's the best way to do something? What's the way you do? And you know, how did you come up with that workflow? Um, when I was writing or copy editing, translating, it's pretty solo work. You can do it on your own time, and you don't necessarily have to always be communicating with people. But I had to give up that independence when I started working in technology, because there's a lot more teamwork, especially when you're only part of the puzzle. So, you know, with a translation gig, for example, someone sends you something, you send it back, it's sort of, it's cut and dry. But when you're working as a content consultant or an information architect, you're definitely going to be doing a lot of back and forth with people, and you're going to have to give up some of that, some of that independence. So, um, giving up the idea that I was going to be able to do things alone without help or without having to work with other people um, was something that I had to had to deal with. And I have to say that it actually enriched my life and my skill set and my career so much because having to rely on other people is a really humbling experience, but also really great in developing sort of that work, that work dynamic. And, and I want to give a, an example of sort of what I did when I was struggling um, with some development issues. I would, I would work on projects, for example, and, and there was another talk where a lady said that she was a website builder. And I love that word, a website builder, because I am not a developer, but I use WordPress enough that I can build something with the blocks that are already there. But when it did come time to have some help developing, I had to find someone to help me. And uh, I'm so happy that this morning that person's in the room today, because um, by pairing up with someone who has complementary skills to you, it's just such a great experience to have that symbiotic relationship where you're having a back and forth and both shining and using the skills that you're best at. The things that are really that come easily to you are different from the things that come easily to that person. And together you can build really awesome stuff. And we were a small enough operation that we would have co-working sessions. And if you're a freelancer or a remote worker, you know what co-working is. You kind of team up with people and, and work on your own things together. Um, but there's like an exchange of ideas that's really beautiful. And so when we would co-work, you know, maybe I would be writing or I would be dealing with some project management things and they would be coding. But I would look over and be like, oh, custom post type. What's that? Oh, you're making a short code. That's going to help me do what I need to do. Can you show me how that's done? And so that very small operation is a great way as a beginner to get exposure to very, you know, simple or complex uh, coding technologies that Otherwise, you might not have sort of a one-on-one -on -one tutor to help you with. 
So I have to say that Befriend's developers, they are amazing people and so nice. So you might be wondering, okay, I'm a writer, I'm here at WordCamp, but like, where can I find these collaborators? And who would be willing to spend that time on me? But you can't really see it like that. Um, WordCamp, if you haven't experienced it already, is so open and welcoming, and it's a really great place to connect with people. And I actually met this developer friend at a WordCamp for the first time uh, last year. So WordCamps are great places to have those conversations and to sort of identify common interests with other people, complementary skill sets, maybe projects that could be in the future, maybe paid contracts in the future. So I would say get connected at WordCamp, get connected at your local uh, WordPress meetups uh, and in other spaces like that because that's where you're going to find people and people can help you with your career ambitions as well. Now the third lie, I'm a fraud. This one is tricky because I, it, you know, even now, speaking about being a fraud, I feel like a fraud. It, it, there's just no way around it. Um, it's really easy to get sucked into this mentality where you feel like an imposter. Imposter syndrome is where you feel out of place. You don't feel like you're well qualified enough to be doing something. And um, I, I, I feel like some people say, yes, recent graduates, recent graduates feel like a fraud. But I don't feel like it actually goes away, depending on on what field you're in and whether you've make, decided to make a recent career move, you can feel like an imposter at any point in your, in your career. But um, I don't necessarily have any quick tip to get rid of it, except that you need to identify your value, identify where you bring value to projects, and celebrate that. The only way really to, to overcome the imposter syndrome is to sort of pinpoint your skills and Make that what you are proud of and present first and use to your advantage. And I think everyone can sort of identify their value and where they bring value to projects because even if it's um, inexperience, even if it's questions that you're bringing to a project, those questions can be super valuable in identifying uh, maybe a UX issue that the designers overlooked. Maybe uh, you're bringing up a, something that no one thought about because they're too immersed in the project. So sometimes it's your inexperience that's actually valuable to a project, which is something to keep in mind. Um, but uh, on the flip side, feeling like a, a, a poser or feeling sort of out of place can also be, uh, you can also harness that. I, I sort of harnessed that feeling uh, to, to get me going. So um, are all of you familiar with the magazine Wired? Any subscribers? Yeah, so I really enjoyed reading Wired magazine even before I got into technology because I just thought the articles were very up to date and cool and they were on topic and they had a really fun way of exploring different issues. And I already had an interest in technology so it wasn't um, that far from, from, my, from my general interest. But I wasn't working in that field. I didn't really know that many people in technology. So I would be reading a really great in-depth article and then there would be a joke about some CEO that I didn't know. And then I'd be like, it'd kind of be a reminder that like, well, you're not really part of that group or that club. And uh, so what I did is that I would sort of highlight all the things that I didn't know in the magazine and then look them up on Google. And sort of just to get, to get more knowledge and to get in the know because, I mean, again, I wanted to have the vocabulary and have the knowledge. And that was something that, where, a time where I harnessed that poser syndrome, that imposter syndrome, uh, to my advantage. But now that we've essentially um, exposed all of my dark thoughts, uh, let's go to the truths. Because I always like to look at the positive, and there were so many positives to the career move that I made. So uh, getting into technology, um, I already had an interest in it, but I didn't really know that much about it. But as I was continued working in it, I realized that I actually knew more than I was giving myself credit for. So I want you guys to think about um, how many hours a day you're looking at a screen or you're interacting with web technology. So now that we all feel really awful about how little exercise or how much, how much time we spend indoors, um, I think it's a, really, it's a really great thing to think about that to spin it this way, we are consuming web technologies all the time. I work on my computer all day long. I, I always have my iPhone. 
Um, I'm looking at screens all the time, and so I'm interacting with technology that is designed by people. And so I have opinions about what works and what doesn't. The button's too small, I can't identify this, the workflow is really weird, the user experience is kind of off, or this is really great and I think it works for this, this reason. And all of you probably have these experiences every day where you're interacting with, with technology that you know, you're making decisions about and you're, you have opinions about. So um, all of that knowledge um, can also be used to, to your advantage in a career as well. You, you know more about, about the web than you think. You might not understand all the code behind it, but you definitely know what works and why, why it works and what doesn't, just as being a user. Um, so if you're even just a blogger or a WordPress super user and you don't necessarily know that much about how to put things together with code, you can easily help other people that are even less knowledgeable or skilled than you. Um, you know, you can help someone set up a blog for the first time. You can guide someone in picking a domain name. These are things that even though you might discount them as not that valuable in knowledge, someone might come to you and, and you might realize that you can actually help someone who's not quite as knowledgeable as you. So it's all about, I mean, there's always going to be someone who knows more and less than you. So you can easily help and be helped. And that's sort of how, how I see it. Um, so I mentioned that for a while I was a... Uh, I was sort of building websites. I had help from a developer, but I was playing around with some of the things that were built into WordPress that I could use and I could create with. So, you know, you can use all sorts of things. Even just using WordPress.com, for example, pick a domain name, pick a theme, use the customizer to pick some colors and some fonts. Um, they have some built-in plugins that you can use. and already you have a pretty beautiful and powerful site and you didn't really have to touch any code. If you're doing a custom installation with WordPress.org, um, plugins can help you do so many things and it's just so easy to go onto a forum and ask for recommendations for the best, the best plugin available or to ask people for support in using some custom CSS. Um, and short codes are amazing. They're like my foray into code because you can really control a lot of things and generate a lot of content using short codes um, without actually delving too much into something complex. So, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do without code um, because WordPress makes it so easy. And if you do want to get more complex, forums are an amazing place to look for help because forums are, even advanced coders look to forums. So there's no shame. The second truth uh, is that job hunting will be unorthodox, but that's okay. And so to kind of give you a brief uh, backgrounder on my last year, I, I quit my job in communications where I was an analyst and I decided to become an intern. So had I been more concerned with the title of that job switch, I probably wouldn't have done it, but I knew it was a company that would open doors for me. So. Um, but I, I don't want to minimize the, the riskiness of doing a career shift. I, I was in a privileged position. I, it was a good time for me. I, it was good timing. But I know that that kind of decision isn't, doesn't come easily to everyone. and It's not something to take lightly. But um, what I decided was that if I was going to do this, I had to give myself the space to make it happen. And that meant going full time into it and uh, not and getting rid of the distraction of a career in a different field. So that was sort of the approach that I took. But um, after my internship with Automatic, it didn't lead to a job right away. And so I felt like I was back to square one. But I actually wasn't. I was a different, I wasn't a different person, but I was sort of a different person professionally. I had different career ambitions and I, I'd see, I saw my path as very different after that internship. And then I, so I freelanced for a bit, and then I, uh, what I realized is that in freelancing, I wasn't qualified enough to apply for a lot of the jobs that I was seeing online, so that's why I was freelancing. But I was creating job opportunities through conversation, through networking, through having um, connections with people and identifying how I could help them with their project, or they would identify how I could help them, and it was really through that networking that I could create job opportunities. And then I also, and then I started working for um, a college where I was a webmaster and, and helped train people uh, to use WordPress uh, as they transferred into a new theme. 
And believe it or not, it was my journalism degree and my experience in project management that landed me that job. It wasn't my technical skill. It wasn't something that I had like thought would be like my, my intermediate WordPress skills would get me this job. It was actually all the stuff that I had done before. And that was not related to technology. So even though on your CV you might feel like you have a very diverse skill set that doesn't necessarily translate into a job in technology, some things are transferable. A lot of things are transferable. And so that's, that's also something to take into consideration as valuable. Um, but the last thing I want to say about job hunting is um, that when I left my job in communications, I had a colleague that sort of took me aside and she said that she was really, um, not jealous, but she really admired what I was doing because she was four years older than me and she already felt like it was too late to make a career change, which was so sad and I, I don't know what her situation was, but I, I kind of felt like that, was, that couldn't be true. But she said that after graduation, she'd sort of taken all these jobs and one after another, she'd refined her, her expertise and what she was qualified for, but it wasn't something that she was passionate about. And that um, just over time, she stayed in a very safe career path and that she felt like it was too late to change. So whether or not that's true, um, it sort of scared me and, and it pushed me to continue doing what I was doing, even though some, some days I felt like I was never going to get a, a stable job or that maybe this had been a mistake. So that definitely encouraged me. And encouraged me uh, into pursuing technology. And now I want to show you a photo to come full circle of this woman on the left in red. Um, at a, this is me at a coding workshop. And so I know that my talk is all about how you can have a career without learning how to code. And, I, and hopefully you've seen that there's opportunities and possibilities for all sorts of different skill sets. Um, but I do want to encourage you, if it's something that you want to learn, that learning code is the next achievable step. And so by doing all of these things with WordPress without diving into the code that much, um, it's crazy how that experience and that exposure really helped me understand what was underneath, what I could discover once I opened up the hood and took a look at, at the code. And uh, you know, I would hear people talk about like the functions.php file, and you know, I'd messed it up a few times, so I knew like, <laughs> that I should probably be more skilled before I tampered with that. Um, the style.css files, you know, sort of understanding how short codes work and how plugins interact and what's generating what, and even widgets, things like that that I sort of had a grasp of early on. But learning the code behind it was so much fun and so, not easy, but you know, it was like the next achievable step. And I also want to say that um, the whole WordPress community is just so welcoming and wants people to learn. So, um, there's so many resources out there to get started and there's so many people that are willing to help you and that are uh, willing to mentor you and it's just not one of those clubs that I imagined where it's like you have to sort of have everything together before attending a WordCamp. Uh, you can come here and sort of be guided and um, be encouraged and be inspired to take the next steps to achieve what you want to do in, in your career and learning to code can be one of those. So I actually want to open up the floor to you because I'm from Montreal. And so when I presented this talk at WordCamp Montreal, I had a few resources available to learn to code. So I know that there's a chapter for ladies learning code in Toronto, which is an organization that I absolutely love and where you can take day long workshops um, on all sorts of code. They do uh, introduction to WordPress. They do introduction to HTML and CSS as well as Python and Ruby. Um, but in Toronto, I wanted to ask the locals, or maybe people that are in the know, what are some resources that are available here for learning to code for beginners or intermediate? Yeah. Humber College. Humber College. <laughs> Compton. Compton. <laughs> WordPress meetups, it's a great. So local. Code Academy, if you want to sort of learn by yourself as well. Okay. Yeah, so we have colleges, WordPress meetups, online websites. I know Linda's very popular. Um, they have a subscription um, format. Every schools is free. 
W3 Schools is free. That's awesome. Uh, Bitmaker. Bitmaker. Code Academy is also free. Code Academy. Okay, so there's a lot out there. A lot out there. That's really awesome. Okay. So now I'm going to take questions. If you have any questions about my career, about anything you'd like to share about how you've made a, a recent career shift, this is a great space to share. One of the uh, uh, best ways to, to uh, learn to code is actually to read code and, and just look and see how people have done things. That's true. Yes? Yeah. I recently uh, discovered um, a series of books that are written very well. I looked at a lot of them and was trying to understand how to pull all this together. I've been working in WordPress for three years and still keep learning what I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, they're, it's, they're done by a man named uh, Jeff Starr, and his uh, the website is called perishablepress.com. I don't get anything for this, but um, his first book was called The Tao of WordPress, T-A-O. Uh, then he goes into digging into WordPress. Then he goes into how to build a theme, and then he has another book on how to deal with uh, HD access, which provides a lot of capability. So. It's the first book set of books I have found that made sense from the perspective that I was trying to learn from, which I already had a picture of what I wanted. What are the pieces and parts I had to know to pull that together, as opposed to, oh, this is what short codes do, this is what plugins do, but which one time do I use what? So I highly recommend the Jeff Starr Perishable Press. Perishable. You buy the PDF, get it printed at FedEx or someplace, they're thick, they're like an inch double. <laughs> Uh, and then when you buy that for free, he updates it every time there's a major WordPress release and you get the updates for free every WordPress release. Mm -hmm. the books are. So that's a good thing. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. if someone wants to. Yeah. Nina, our wonderful room host. <laughs> okay, so Perishable Press. I can also, I'll, I'll tweet these out later too. Um. <coughs> yes. I'm just curious of many of your comments. I think because you're from Montreal, you know, a lot of people from Montreal, it's a bilingual community. Yes. Does that help in terms of web development as being part of a bilingual community? Like, um, uh, I know there's a lot of people in Toronto who are multilingual. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of work, I would say it does, because when you think of building a website, when you get into multilingual, it's essentially a duplicate, and it's tw almost twice the work sometimes. So in terms of opportunities for, for work, that it does create more opportunities. It's, it's more work. You're translating or you're creating twice the number of pages that you were before. So that definitely gives it a, a boost. Um, I think in terms of the... the community, it can, it can be a double-edged sword. It can make the community richer because you're working with so many different people in two languages, um, but it can also have its own um, challenges and that you're trying to cater all in one language for some people that could be unilingual and also include other people that could be bilingual but could also not be. So um, for web development, I think it it can create a little bit of a headache when people are considering, okay, this needs to be bilingual. It's twice the work. Also twice the work for a freelancer, which is good. Um, but it definitely does, it, it, it is another layer of consideration, even when we were organizing WordCamp Montreal, to make sure that we had enough speakers in French to attract the French community. That also meant there were a lot of talks that unilingual Anglophones wouldn't attend. So that does some good things and some challenges as well. <laughs>